Hello everybody, welcome to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf and I'm here today to learn with you about our furry, scaly, or slimy friends all around uh, the globe and today's episode is the ostrich episode. So we're going to be learning all about this amazing uh, flightless bird here. We're going to get into some of the facts in just a second. Um, but we do have some uh, exciting announcements regarding the podcast or something to do with the podcast rather. So um, the past uh, however many episodes I've been kind of um, encouraging you guys to write in and some of you have but uh, I made it a lot easier to write in uh, well, in a, in a different way. So there is now a Relax with Animal Facts website. And if you go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com, you can go on the website. And uh, basically, it's going to be a place where you can easily request. Uh, you can go on your phone or on your uh, tablet, your uh, laptop, anything like that, your computer. And you can listen to all the podcast episodes. You can also um, request animals. So if you hop onto relaxwithanimalfacts.com, you can go to animal requests and you can send me whatever you would like. You don't have to use your real name if you if you don't like, because any any um, animal requests that I end up doing on the show, I will shout the name out. So if you don't want your real name being used, you can use whatever name you'd like. Um, so there are uh, a few things that are going to be going on on this website so things like uh, i'm going to be uh, writing articles specific to positive restoration projects that are happening all over the world rather than focusing on just the negative ones so um, positive uh, environmental sort of articles that uh, uh, have to do with animals and, conser and conserving the planet things like that um, and the final thing that you can do on this, um, so all the links are, are there for the Spotify, the iTunes, the Stitcher, it's all on there. Um, and uh, if you want to further support the show, there is also a, a donation button. It is absolutely up to you guys. If you want to help support the show in another way, uh, you, you have the ability to do that. But this is mainly a forum for, for me to interact with you guys uh, by you. Uh, you can contact me on there if you have any feedback. There's a contact button. There's animal request button and you can listen to the show on there so very exciting i spent a while getting this website together and there are i'm sure a few things that i have to work through if anything doesn't uh, if you find maybe a button that doesn't work or something like that it'll most likely be one of the maybe social media ones or something that i that i missed that's small um, you can always uh, send me uh, send me in on the contact us or contact me thing on the website, you can go ahead and, uh, and let me know if you do find anything like that. But anyways, that's just some exciting news. I just wanted to let all of you know, you can now request your animals easily, anonymously if you'd like, uh, on relaxwithanimalfacts.com. So this is a show where I relax with you guys, and I go online, find facts to do with a certain animal, and I kind of go through them with all of you. So we delve into an animal together. I am not an animal researcher. Uh, other than than googling uh, facts, uh, so I'm not a, any kind of animal biologist or anything like that. I'm just like you, and I enjoy doing this podcast because I enjoy learning uh, learning with all of you. There are a variety of ways you can listen to the podcast. For any of you new listeners out there, you can listen to it as a kind of wind down routine at the end of your day. You can listen to it in the middle of the day. Maybe you're at work or you're stuck in traffic and you just want something to occupy your time and um, and learn a little something while relaxing. Uh, this is definitely the podcast for you, and if you like animals, of course. So uh, any way that you listen to this podcast is entirely encouraged, and I welcome all of you here with me today. I got all of my information this episode from only one source, from onekindplanet.org. Uh, they had so many facts that if I was to even browse around other websites, uh, it would be, um, or if I was to even include things from other websites, I would have to uh, do the podcast for an hour. So I decided to take facts from that website. I'm going to go through all of them. Uh, some of them are just little quick facts. Some of them are a little bit more in-depth. And we're going to get into that now. So welcome to the show. Let's get into the ostrich. So the first, um, of course, fact is that the flightless ostrich is the world's largest bird. Um, by largest... I assume they mean by weight because I am not sure if there are some other I, like such as cranes or flamingos if their height is relatively similar but by largest I'm sure that they mean uh, by weight and they must be a similar height to many of those other large birds uh, so flightless bird and the world's largest bird as well 
they have three stomachs, which to me is incredibly interesting, and I have a lot of questions about that that I couldn't find answers to, such as what the, um, I guess, adaptation is for having three stomachs. Uh, I imagine it would be uh, due to a huge variation in diet or of some kind that they need three stomachs to digest. I have no idea or if it's just sort of a portal system that works from one to the other and they connect somehow, but that's really interesting. They have a very unique digestive system, but I wish I could tell you more about it, but I couldn't find I couldn't find much. Maybe I should become an animal researcher so I could tell you. So ostriches are the fastest runners of any birds or other two-legged animals and can sprint at over 70 kilometers an hour, which is incredibly fast. I did not know that they ran this quickly. Uh, for any of you uh, individuals listening in the United States, no need to pull out the uh, the calculator there. I did it for you. 70 kilometers an hour. We're talking f- about 43, uh, t- around 43, 45, or 44 miles per hour. So as you can imagine, this huge bird running that quickly is, is uh, really uh, an incredible sight, I'm sure. I haven't seen it before, but they have huge legs in, in comparison to, um, to the rest of their body proportions, and this is what allows them to run uh, that quickly. So they can cover up to five meters in a single stride. So talking um, birds right now, uh, flightless birds, we have penguins, which is a, a, prime, a prime animal for a future podcast, but we have, we have penguins, we have some other kinds of flightless birds, but none of them seem to have this incredible ability to run very fast while with the penguins they have adaptations to um, their walking as, as you can imagine they waddle around is not the easiest thing in the world they much prefer swimming and they're very efficient swimmers but ostrich uh, they like to run instead I hope that we cover whether they can swim or not uh, so I'm going to leave that for now uh, but uh, but we will see So unlike all other living birds, these guys are unique in the fact that they secrete urine separately from feces. So they have kind of a different uh, sort of excretory uh, process for number one and number two. Their digestive system seems to have some very interesting characteristics, you know, having three stomachs and having two separate sort of uh, 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 excretory processes. And it's something that I haven't even heard of before. I feel like I would have heard this in the past, but I haven't. So now all of you out there know as well that they have a... If you think of ostrich, you got to think of them now as having a really intricate and different sort of excretory and digestive system. So ostriches running is aided by having just two toes on each foot. I did not know that. And most birds uh, have four, that's just for for relativity, so they have half of the normal amount of uh, toes on each foot, and they have a large nail on the larger inner toe, which resembles almost uh, like a hoof. So hooves are very good for certain sorts of animals, for example, mountain goat, right, have very specific kind of hooves that help them uh, have traction and maintain traction on really hard uh, hard to, to maneuver Uh, sort of areas. I would imagine this nail is for uh, creating this hoof would be for grip, uh, for gripping sake, because the faster you go, you don't have that much control, especially when it comes to turning. So if they're going 70 kilometers an hour or 45 uh, miles per hour, you're going to need solid um, grip when it comes to uh, moving on the ground because it would be easy to slip if they were to turn in really any any direction. So I imagine that this is what it's for, but of course I'm just extrapolating from my own knowledge and applying it. Whether this is true or not, I am not entirely sure. But that's what, what this podcast is all about, is, is learning here with you. And maybe, maybe we have an ostrich researcher out there somewhere that can reach out. Um, so ostriches' wings reach a span of about two meters and are used in mating displays to shade chicks uh, to cover the naked skin of their upper legs and their rear ends to conserve heat. Um, and this also acts as, as, a, as a rudder to help them change direction while running. So we're going to cover, uh, we all already mentioned the cheetah's tail before. We're going to use this example one more time here where the cheetah can use 
the, its tail similarly like a rudder to help them change direction very quickly because um, for them as predatory animals they need to be able to change direction quickly because what they're chasing you know they're not going to run in, in, a, in a complete straight line a lot of the times they zigzag and and sort of run around like that um, but with the ostrich having these wings have uh, a huge purpose even though they can't fly so it's 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 um, always cool for me to see uh, I would have thought that their wings at this point was almost a vestigial trait. Vestigial meaning that it has no use anymore, but it's just there because the, uh, the genes haven't uh, completely gotten rid of it yet. But in the case of the ostrich, they seem to use it for uh, plenty of reasons uh, other than flying because they don't fly. So they use it as rudders, they use it to shade chicks, to cover their own skin, uh, and in mating displays. So having two meter long uh, wings can make for a very impressive mating display. And in birds, this is a very common theme. And in uh, many birds that we're going to cover in the future of this podcast, there are so many complicated rituals and dancing and, and all these mating sort of propositions. It's, it's really, really interesting to watch. And there's so many documentaries about it that uh, if you'd like to watch, if you'd like to spoil the, the future podcast for yourself, you can absolutely do that. But we'll talk about that on a future show. Territorial fights between males, for females of course, will usually last uh, just minutes because they can easily uh, cause each other death from slamming their heads into, into each other, into, into their opponent. So in, in the case of, of ostriches and many other animals, the need for or the, the biological drive for reproduction sort of goes past any other sort of animal instinct, which is to not, uh, of course, hurt yourself. Uh, but in the case of ostriches, they really, really uh, compete and it can, you know, just last a few minutes because they can just drop uh, dead from some sort of brain uh, or head injury. So when they're threatened, they will run, although their powerful long legs can be used as, as you can imagine, very formidable weapons. So, of course, it is capable of killing a human being if they're running 70 miles, uh, 70 kilometers an hour, you know that these... Um, just like how a car has uh, wheels and tires, right? Um, they need very strong legs to be able to get to the speeds that they get to. So you know that they have extremely powerful legs. And um, it can even kill, potentially kill a predator, such as a lion, just with a forward kick. So um, any martial artists out there, I think that if the ostrich was to, was to do maybe any kind of kickboxing or Muay Thai, they would be a... a uh, certainly a, a formidable opponent. So let's move on here. Ostriches normally spend the winter months in pairs or alone. It really it really depends and during the breeding season. But sometimes uh, they have there's these extreme rainless periods uh, where they will live in herds of 5 to 50 birds which is led by a top hen or an alpha male sort of hen figure. And they will often travel together with other animals specifically grazers, so we have we have zebras included in that, also an, an amazing animal we can cover, uh, antelopes. So they really, it, it, it really depends on what the conditions are like, whether they are in pairs alone or even in, uh, in herds. But herds is not as common as being solitary or in being pairs, right? So all of the herds' hens place their eggs in the dominant hen's nest which can be up to three meters wide so the dominant hen's nest uh, will have first the dominant hen's egg in the center of course because that's where you would imagine is the warmest area and the other females can sort of uh, place their eggs in there and they can also determine which eggs are whose just by just by looking at them which is very which is uh, of course an adaptive trait i'm sure because you don't want to be raising someone else's young uh, as an ostrich because they're interested in pers in uh, advancing their own uh, bloodline right so uh, their own gene pool so the giant eggs are the largest of any living bird at 15 centimeters long and can weigh as much as two dozen chicken eggs, and I wonder what the nutritional value is of the, uh, of these. I imagine it's incredibly saturated with uh, with nutrients. And though they are actually the smallest eggs relative to the size of the adult bird, so when we talk about relativity, 
how large their egg is in proportion to the size of the uh, ostrich egg is is uh, still the smallest when you compare a a chicken to a chicken's egg when we're talking relativity it is actually uh, larger in comparison but um, of course when you put an ostrich egg next to a chicken egg you're going to see a huge difference in size that's a lot larger than a chicken egg so we're going to talk really quickly about the complex mating ritual of the ostrich now i can't summarize this i'm just going to read it verbatim because there's no way that i can uh, i can really make this any simpler than it is and i also wouldn't really know what the terms are so the ostrich will um, or the male ostrich will first alternate wing beats until he attracts a mate where uh, they will go to the mating area and drive away all the intruders. And it, this is a pretty common theme among many uh, rituals performed by birds. So there's plenty of birds that like to clear out the area, whether it be uh, cleaning, with, cleaning the sticks out, cleaning uh, leaves and things like that. Uh, in this case, they sort of ward off any intruders. So they will graze until the behavior is synchronized. Then the feeding becomes secondary and the process takes on a ritualistic appearance. The cock, the, the, the male, will then excitedly flap alternate wings again and start poking on the ground with his bill. He will then violently flap his wings to symbolically clear out a nest in the dirt. Then while the hen runs circles around him with lowered wings, he will wind his head in a spiral motion. She will then uh, drop to the ground where he will mount for copulation. So as you can see, there was not much room for me to sort of summarize there, but um, this is a complex ritual, of course, as far as mating rituals go with, with all animals, but relative to birds, we know that, that they have, different species of birds have varying complexities, but relative to other animals they have some of the most complex mating rituals of any uh, groups of animals so of course i'm not that surprised that they have this this interesting um, sort of uh, ritual when the eggs hatch after 35 to 45 days of incubation the male usually defends the hatchlings and will teach them how to feed the males and the females many birds uh, the males and the females will cooperate in rearing the chicks. So it's not just the female like we see in many other species, which is, uh, which is good. I assume that they are monogamous or selectively monogamous. We talked about this on another podcast, but it had to do with the um, selective sort of monogamy that many birds engage in. So they are monogamous, but they will also uh, cheat once in a while or more often than you would think. So they aren't exactly polygamous or polygamists, they are monogamous, just selectively so. So they are majority monogamous, but not really. And I wonder if that's the same for uh, ostriches. I mean, if they're birds, I'm sure they fall into the same category. The eggs are incubated by the dominant female by day, and the male will take over the night shift. So over the night time, uh, he will take over for the female, and they will use the coloration uh, of the two sexes to escape detection in the, uh, of the nest. So as the female blends in with the sand, the black male is nearly undetectable in the dark. So it's not only a thing where male ostriches tend to prefer the night shift. We're talking a, an evolutionary adaptation to doing this. There is a reason, and it is the reason of a sort of camouflage almost, right? To be able to hide your eggs. Because while the ostrich can run 70 kilometers an hour and it has incredibly powerful legs, eggs are still eggs. They're still, you know, baby... Uh, ostriches inside eggs they can't really defend themselves so uh, you have to the the parents defend them in this way and it's an it is a, an incredible adaptation that they have there where their the, the difference in their fur color determines who is incubating the eggs when very very cool you guys know i like my lemon balm any of you out there that have any sort of um, beverage there it's important to, to hydrate don't forget you guys can hydrate with me there so Contrary to popular belief, ostriches do not bury their heads in the sand. That is a disappointing fact for me because I have, I, I grew up watching cartoons where there was always an ostrich or large bird that hides 
their head in the sand to avoid detection of, of some sort or if they're scared. But let's see where it originates from. So here it says that the, that the myth probably, probably not, not uh, entirely sure, they, that it originates from the bird's defensive behavior of lying low at, uh, at the approach of trouble and pressing their long necks to the ground in an, in an attempt to become less visible. So this makes sense to me because they are huge birds. They're kind of hard to hide, right? It's not like regular birds can just fly away into the trees. We have a huge animal capable of running incredibly quickly. How are they going to hide or avoid detection if need be? If they, say, don't have the energy to run or they are uh, still incubating their eggs and want to and stay undetected, lowering their heads to the ground is a good way of reducing visibility. So their plumage blends well with the sandy soil that they uh, are in, and from a distance it gives the appearance that they have buried their, head, their heads in the sand. And ostriches live in dry, hot savannas and woodlands of Africa. So uh, they once were in Asia, but Africa is, is where they are uh, now. So they used to roam all over Asia and the Arabian Peninsula, but uh, they were hunted extensively as, as it goes with humans, right? And their range was just reduced to the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. They have inspired cultures and civilizations for 5,000 years in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. I hope I said that, that first one right. I believe I did. So th there's, there's plenty of birds that influence culture all over the world. We talked about flamingos influencing culture in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and in the case of the ostrich, we have uh, inspiration towards Mesopotamia and Egypt for uh, close to 5,000 years, which is amazing. The ostrich is farmed around the world, particularly for the decorative feathers that it has, but also for the meat, which is marketed commercially, and the skin is used for leather products. I wouldn't say that I support this very much. I'm sure in certain um, cultures, eating ostrich I, might be a necessity, but uh, here in the Western world, I don't think that... Uh, Farming ostriches for meat commercially is necessarily a good thing. Their numbers in terms of their uh, population, I am not entirely sure about. They could be endangered, but they've already been hunted out of m many different parts of the world. So uh, I, I, I don't, I try not to put any opinion on it, but I personally would not uh, eat ostriches for their meat. I don't think that, um, that uh, consciously that would go very well for me. In some African countries, people race each other on the back of ostriches, and they do this with the help of reins, bits, and these special saddles that they can use. So, obviously, human beings see this two-legged, flightless bird moving at 70 kilometers an hour, and they say, I want to ride that thing. And it, that, is, that is the human experience. That has been an advantage in the past, but I can't imagine... Um, People riding on the back of ostriches at this current moment. It's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit comedic to me. So they do not have teeth, and they will swallow pebbles to grind their food. Wow. So an adult ostrich carries about one kilogram of stones at any one time. Completely unintuitive. I did not know that. But it is amazing to me that they know, or that you know, it's an instinctive thing to swallow pebbles in order to properly grind their food because they don't have that mechanical digestive mechanism up there in the top via, via teeth like us humans have. The wild ostrich population has declined drastically, okay there we go, in the last 200 years with most surviving birds in game parks or on farms. So this is mainly why I usually don't um, support the farming or, or the uh, not f well farming and the commercial sort of uh, distribution of their skin and of their uh, meat and whatnot is because these are sort of exotic birds in a way and their population has dwindled a lot in the in the in the past uh, 200 years so the ostrich has the largest eye of any land animal measuring almost five centimeters across so five centimeters doesn't sound like a lot but the human eyeball is definitely not five centimeters across and this allows predators such as lions uh, and other sort of big cats and whatnot to be seen at long distances. So they have very uh, good eyesight, and I assume that that's what they rely on uh, prominently. 
And unlike most birds, the males have a copulatory organ, which is retractable and 20 centimeters long. Retractable is not a word you often see with reproductive organs. So not only do they have an interesting digestive system and excretory system, they have a cool um, reproductive system as well as it seems. Ostriches can go drinking, go on without drinking for several days using metabolic water and moisture in the roots that they eat. We've seen this already in previous herbivores that they will get the, their majority of moisture from the food that they eat, specifically plants. They also get it from seeds and insects, but they do enjoy liquid water and will frequently take baths if it is available. This is still sub-Saharan Africa we're talking about here, so I'm sure that they enjoy drinking water and as well bathing in water so i always love to end the podcast with something to do with the name of the animal so the late latin struthio ostrich came from the greek struthion or strauthion sorry and that came from the strauthos megale which means big sparrow so that is as deep as I would like to get into that name. It was, it was a, a little bit uh, convoluted. That's as easy as I can make it. And the Greeks also knew the bird as Strauthocamelos, which is described as or translated as the camel sparrow, specifically for its long neck. So rich history when it comes to the name has been named by different cultures over time and has just kind of blended to just be called the ostrich. So thank you all so very much for tuning in. The next episode will most likely be a fan episode from uh, from some fan submissions that I've been getting. If you want to submit a an animal for a future episode, go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com. Go to animal requests. You can do that on your phone, your tablet, your computer. Go ahead and submit an animal. So thank you all so very much for tuning in. I will see you guys on the next episode with the next animal. Take care.